All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with me for the Wealth Being Online series. Our topic today, we want to talk about how you can generate profit while creating impact. And with me today is a very special guest. I am delighted to have him. He is the creator and the host of a podcast called Wellness Paradox with a career spanning over three decades in fitness, health, and wellness. He has a very deep knowledge of exercise physiology health and wellness coaching, and lifestyle interventions to mitigate chronic disease and leadership. Thank you so much for being here with us, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yay. Okay. So tell us three, over three decades doing what you do. So where, where did it all start it for you and why, why health and wellness, right? And um, what, what kept you in it for so long? Yeah, I think origin stories are always so important. And, and for me, my origin story comes from being an overweight kid in high school. Uh, I graduated high school. I was about 285 pounds, about 100 pounds more than what I am now. And when you're an overweight kid in high school, it's not the most comfortable place to be emotionally. You get picked on for being overweight. And that was the case for me. But when I, when I was a freshman in high school, I found this little tiny YMCA weight room uh, in a small suburb of, of Metro Detroit. And I found a guy whose name was Al. That's actually all I know of him. I don't know his last name. I don't know where he is, who kind of took me under his wing and was my mentor, my first coach. And he helped me gain access to this environment. That was the, the first place I ever felt like I belonged socially which when you're 13, 14 years old, you know you don't care about what your parents think of you. You don't care about what your teachers think of you. You care about what your peers think about you. And, and in school, I was picked on by my peers. But in this, in this little tiny YMCA gym, which I feel like is maybe no larger than twice the size of my office here, uh, it was the first place I felt safe and, and included socially. And that had a profound impact on my life. And what I've been trying to do ever since then is help create safe and inclusive environments for people to be able to achieve their health and their fitness goals while at the same time feeling like they belong in those environments. So that, that's, that's my origin story. So really much, it very much is at the heart of my being. And I think that's why I've stayed in it for as long as I have at this point, because this is a hard industry as a lot of your audience will know to make money in. And there's, it's a very serpentine path. And it's something that I'm passionate about at a very soul level because of what it did for me that I've just tried to give that to other people. Oh my goodness. Uh, I don't know how you did all of that in like less than two minutes. <laughs> and it's so I've, I've, said, I've, said, I've said that story many, many times. Yeah. And so tell me, I mean, yeah, yes, that got you to where you want it to be today. And you've been in it because you know that you can create that kind of transformation, but right. Like at how old were you when, at the, when you met your mentor? I was, I was 13. It was when I started high school, 13, 14 years old, very, very, very young and fresh and rule age. Okay. So tell us like a step before that, like, right. Like what made you, cause I know when it comes to want to be healthy again or lose weight or whatever it may be, the new habit you want to adapt, right. There's always like, what got you to do the first step? So what got you to enter yourself into this little gym? Like what got you there? Yeah, well, funny enough, the 12 year old version of me thought I was going to play in the NBA. The problem is, I was 5'8 in eighth grade and I'm 5'8 right now. And my NBA dreams died on a vine. But I told my mom that I needed to lift weights because I wanted to be able to dunk a basketball. And I didn't realize that my decision at that point to say, hey, I want to go to the gym to be a better basketball player would be such a massive inflection point in my life that would literally dictate my trajectory for you know, the rest of my life. But that, that was the initial impetus for going to the gym was I wanted to be a better athlete. And what I found was something that was so much more, and not only from a, a, a physical fitness perspective, but then I, I can't stress this enough, but it was the, it was the emotional and the psychological well-being that I was able to garner from that environment. That's really uh, kept me so motivated over the years to be a part of this. It's for me, it's much less about 
the physical benefits, although those are very important and don't get me wrong, like the reason that people should be more physically active is because it does improve their physical health. But for me, it was the emotional and the psychological side of things that has really galvanized me over the years. Yeah, I think you hit it right, right on the nail on the on top of the head because it's interesting the emotional and the psychological connection is what keeps people going. At least I'm speaking from firsthand experience. I mean, unless I'm connected to my goal emotionally, whether it's weight loss or, you know, taking my business to the next level, unless I have that connection to why I'm doing it, um, there will be very little motivation, nor there would be any kind of action <laughs> to start. So how do you, right? Because health and fitness. Like I, I think in general, especially with the diet industry and everything in general, I think we have a bad rep, right? Like with like you, it's all about weightlifting or it's all about creating that six pack. It's about like keto or, you know, like fasting, all of the things. So because of what you were experiencing and, and were able to, um, I guess, uh, experience in your, when you were 12 and up into whenever it is, you know, and, and still now, like, how are you incorporating that uh, emotional and psychological side of things into, you know, your work? Because considering that everything is so surface level, so physical, you know? Yeah, I think, I think that this reflects as a whole, I think the industry now, particularly post COVID is starting, well, we're not post yet, but as we're hopefully coming out of COVID, we're starting to learn the errors of our ways in the past. And we've been very physically oriented for a very, very long time. And the problem with every physically oriented goal that you have is that it's very distal. Meaning, you know, if you want to lose 20 pounds, that's, you know, several months away. If you want to improve your blood pressure, you want to live longer. Like that's, that's occurring like way down there. And I think what I've realized over time, and I think people that under appreciate the psychological and the emotional aspect is that people are continually motivated to do something because of, of proximal results and all of those proximal results, all those things that you can, that you can feel and you can gain the benefit of immediately are things that are psychological and they're emotional. They're, they're your energy levels, how you feel to your point, the ability to be able to connect with other people in that environment that you're in, the ability to be able to feel accomplished. So for me, when I look at this from two perspectives, the perspective of a fitness and, and health professional that's coaching clients, which I do a little bit of, or from the perspective of an educator and an industry advocate that is trying to get our industry to a better place on the healthcare continuum, I think it's critical to emphasize and make sure that you're working with people to really magnify the emotional and the psychological benefits because those are the proximal benefits that people can feel in the moment to get that instant gratification that is how our brains are wired to keep them continually motivated to, to go and do it. So long story short, I can wrap that up in, it, it's a very important paradigm shift to go away from just the, the physical and the health oriented benefits of activity and nutrition and shift towards the emotional and the psychological benefits, because that is something that you can actually be able to point to on a day by day, moment to moment basis and say, I'm achieving this and I can feel myself getting better. So that's what ties up the emotional component. Yeah, no, I totally get it. I see that. And so for example, let's say, right, because we're so drawn to instant gratification or wanting to get there already, like losing already that 20 pounds and getting that six pack. So what would you say to, let's say to a client who, yes, understand the benefits of the long-term uh, scheme of things that, yeah, I'm going to be healthier. My blood, blood, blood sugar is going to be lower, whatever, et cetera. But they're like, but I am like, I was supposed to lose whatever, like X, Y, Z amount of weight by this time, because that's part of our plan and they're frustrated and they wanted to give up. Like what would be the conversation you would have with them? Well, this is what, this is what we should consider. Like, how do you get them back to reality? It's a hard conversation to have because their expectations are, are supercharged by the media and by the internet and by their Facebook and their Instagram feeds. And when you're coming at it from an evidence-based perspective, it's just, it, it's, it's very different. Like I, I say this all the time. If I took out an ad that said, lose four pounds in four weeks sustainably, no one's clicking on that ad. Yet everyone will click on the lose 20 pounds in 20 days ad. So I think it starts 
right from the get with an expectation setting based conversation and letting people know what the evidence suggests, what the real science suggests of what's a, a, a healthy and a sustainable way to improve your weight, but also not discount that as an important goal. And I fully believe that the most successful people in achieving any goal in life maximize their autonomy in the goal setting process and then in the achievement of that, the process that goes into achieving that goal. Therefore, I respect that you have that goal. Let's set the goal and then let's set it on a shelf and go back to it every so often. But now let's set some shorter term goals that are more emotionally based, are more psychologically based, are more um, process oriented. And let's, let's tie our gratification and our fulfillment to those. And then every like six weeks, let's pull back out that weight loss goal and let's, let's check ourselves against that goal and see how we're doing. So for me, it's shifting the emphasis away from that outcome measure that's more distal to more process oriented goals that are, are much more proximal. And I think as a coach, that's what your job is. Your job is to help the client decide where their, where their focus should be. Where are they, where are they shining that beam that is the flashlight? Are they trying to shine it way down there at something they can barely see? Or are they trying to shine it on something that's right here in front of them that they can feel fulfilled for now? So it's a lot of conversation. It's a lot of empathy. And I think it's a lot of dialogue to get, not for me to shift their perspective, but to get them to shift their own perspective. Yeah, no, I think the key word for me from what you just shared is empathy. Because ultimately it's a hard, it's a hard road, right? Like whether it's losing weight or really taking on health and wellness to that next level. I mean, I've like, I'm, I'm firsthand experience with, with myself, with everything. And so empathy is huge. I believe in, in this whole process, because unless the person is not compassionate, you know, with themselves and really allowing them to see their own progress there, there's no progress made just because they're so busy beating themselves up rather than congratulating yourself for like just working out like the three days that they promised to work out. So I love this question and I'm excited to hear what you have to say to this. Is that because you've been in the industry for over three decades? Where do you see the future of health and wellness? I see it with an integration between, well, first off, the words you use, I think are very appropriate. I think we're moving away from the concept of health and fitness. And I think we're moving towards the concept of health and wellness. We're moving in the concept of something that's more holistic. I think there's an integration between health and wellness and the medical community. I think that has to exist if we're going to truly effectuate any sort of significant change in public health, particularly given the rates of chronic disease that we have as a population right now. Uh, that is absolutely a critical step in not only the, the public health of our country, but also the economic stability of the country. And I've said this many times, as the diabetes epidemic becomes more and more prevalent, and as the you know, 90 plus million Americans that are pre-diabetic transition over to becoming diabetic, the economic costs of that are absolutely going to be crippling. And if we don't have fitness and wellness professionals that can start to treat some of the, the upstream causes of those very costly downstream consequences, we're in a lot of trouble. So I think the, there's an integration that exists between you know, health and wellness or health, wellness, and fitness, however you want to term that, and medicine. And that's actually the whole thesis behind my podcast. Like my podcast that I started in conjunction with U of M, the whole thesis behind that is you know, health and, and fitness and wellness professionals have the answers to help people address a lot of these chronic health conditions but they're not talking to the medical professionals that are treating the downstream consequences. And if we don't start to talk to each other, we're never gonna be able to effectuate any large scale change on population health. Yeah, I know, I love that. And that's a great segue. Tell us a little bit more about your podcast and yeah, you shared the thesis already, but what's the intention? What's ultimately the drive behind the Paradox um, podcast? Yeah, so first off, I define the wellness paradox as kind of what I just said is that fitness, wellness, and health professionals have a lot of the skill set that's needed to help treat the chronic disease epidemic and to help in the healthcare continuum, but there's this lack of trust, communication, and interaction between those professionals and medical professionals, and we, we have to bridge that gap somehow, and the goal of the podcast is to help fitness and wellness professionals level up their skill set to be able to work on the healthcare continuum with other allied health professionals. Like, there, there should be the same 
respect given to a personal trainer or a wellness coach as there is given to a physical therapist and a physician assistant and a nurse practitioner, but we're just not there yet. And it's a complicated problem. And I don't, I don't claim to have the solution to it. I think that the solution is generative from multiple conversations. And this is something I've been trying to, I've thought about how I would solve this for probably the latter half of my, my career in the industry, probably for the past you know, 12 to 14 years, like, hey, how do we make this happen? And I realized it's, I just need to talk to a lot of people and I need to learn from a bunch of people. And I need to put that knowledge out in the world for other people to learn from. And that's, that's really the goal of the podcast. And I'm very grateful to have it uh, backstopped, if you will, by University of Michigan and the Block M. I tell people this all the time. I don't know how many people are interested in talking to Mike Stack, but I know a lot of people are interested in talking to University of Michigan. And as a result, I've gotten amazing guests. Cedric Bryant from the American Council on Exercise, David Katz from the True Health Initiative, John Berardi, who's the former owner and founder of Precision Nutrition, Kate Collins, the, uh, the president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine great minds that are all working towards the same thing. So that, that's the podcast in a nutshell. It's for fitness and wellness professionals that say we should be part of the healthcare continuum. We're not, and we need to get there. My podcast, I think, is one vehicle amongst many that can help us move us, move us in that direction. Great. And um, I want to ask about this because this is part of why we're so intrigued to interview you, is that how is health and wellness uh, related to leadership? Mm, health and wellness related to leadership. I think, and that's, that's a good question because you, you first, you hear that question and you think, ah, man, those are kind of divergent things. Like they don't come together. I think you can only take care of others as well as you can take care of yourself. There, there's something to be said for putting your own oxygen mask on first before helping others around you. And if you're going to be a leader, you're going to be emotionally intelligent enough to be a leader, to be able to connect with people on that level. You need to be fully present on every single level. And I don't know how I can do what I do at, throughout the course of my day and my week without being a, a healthy individual physically, emotionally, and psychologically. And again, self-care is more than just, I go to the gym and I lift or I ride the exercise bike and I do cardio. It's proper sleep, proper stress management, it's meditation, it's, it's all these things in the constellation of well-being that put me in the right position to be an effective leader uh, when I have the opportunity. So that's the tie-in that I see. Like if you, And for all the entrepreneurs out there, no matter what your business is, fitness, a hardware store, a real estate agent, when you stop taking care of yourself as a whole, then your business is going to suffer. No matter if you think that extra hour that you're spending on your business is better spent than going to the gym or meditating or whatever, um, that's just your perception of that. And the reality is, because I've been there before, you're the worst person to judge if that was a good use of your time because you have a skewed perspective on it. So I think it's, it's critical to be healthy, fit, and well if you are going to be an effective leader. Yeah, no, I, I love it. No matter how many times I can be preaching what you just said, coming from you is very different. And absolutely for myself, honestly, ultimately, I wouldn't be able to do exactly like you said, do what I do and or even have this idea of putting the show together if I wasn't taking care of myself to be clear minded enough to say like, yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> and, you know, and to put resources and energy into it. So amazing. So how can we, um, can you share a couple tips that we can take on um, to embark on the journey to health and wellness? I think the first tip, so the, the two tips I'm going to give, I think are possibly surprising given my background as an exercise physiologist. Again, I'm a, I'm a clinically trained exercise physiologist. My clinical background is muscle physiology and histology. Like I'm a nerd as to what happens at the cellular level in a muscle, but my tips are not going to be around that at all. In fact, they're not even going to be around exercise at all. I think the two fundamental health habits that everyone should consider engaging with, and they're both equally important. I don't put one above the other is first sleeping. I think proper sleep, like sleep is a keystone health and wellness habit. It really is. And that research is emerging every day of the critical nature of sleep. So making sure you're getting enough sleep, making sure your, your sleep patterns are consistent, trying to go to bed and wake up at roughly the same time every day, anything you can do to improve your sleep hygiene, there's knock-on effects 
on that in every single aspect of your life. Just like if you have poor sleep hygiene, there's knock on effects of that in every single aspect of your life. So first is sleep. And then secondly, some aspect of mindfulness. I am a very, very big proponent of mindfulness meditation, uh, not in a, a religious sense or in a spiritual sense, but just in terms of being able to uh, take perspective on your thoughts and your emotions, be able to create some distance, be able to stay present in the moment without being distracted and without your mind going 8,000 different places. I think those are the keystone health habits that people can develop. And if you actually cement those, then it becomes so much easier to make change with your nutrition, with your physical activity. But if those two things aren't cemented, they're going to influence your ability to make healthy choices eating wise, and then consistently implement a physical activity habit in your life. So those, those would be my two suggestions. Don't care which one you start with. I don't even recommend you start with both. Pick one, whatever you think is most appealing to you and go there first. And I guarantee you'll, you'll feel to our point earlier on the emotional and psychological level, you'll feel the difference very, very proximally to when you implement those habits. Yeah. Well, if you have to ask me between the two, I'll choose sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, fair enough. And, and yes, I think, I think sleep might be the most foundational habit of all. And I think it is the thing that is most neglected by entrepreneurs and hard charging people. And I could say that from somebody who, when I started my business back in the early 2000s, I was sleeping four hours a night. And I, I just like the, the person who's drunk isn't a good person to assess their ability to drive after they've been drinking. As the person that was sleep deprived, I yeah. was a terrible person to assess how sleep deprived I really was. And it's kind of like, you don't know how bad you were feeling until you started to feel better. That's how I look at some of my previous sleep habits. And I think it's such an important thing. So I'm, I'm hundred percent with you on what you said there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. I've learned so much. And I could also feel like your commitment, like with your mission and what, what you want to do. So Michael, how do we find you? Like, how can the audience find you? And um, if you have any last minute parting remarks, we would love it. And as far as where to find me, uh, the podcast website is wellnessparadoxpod.com. And then on any social media platforms, I'm just at wellnessparadox. Uh, please follow me on there. I push a lot of content out that's similar to what we talked about here. And you know, my, my only parting thoughts, and I give this to everyone and everything in life is just always ask yourself the, if the story you're telling yourself about life serves you well. I think we get ourselves in a lot of trouble in life because we tell ourselves stories that just don't serve us all that well. And if we could have better perspective on the stories we tell ourselves and we could tell ourselves more workable stories, I think life not only ends up being more tolerable, but a lot more fulfilling. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your knowledge, your wisdom, your energy, your motivation, and uh, for doing what you do, because we sure all need it. I mean, uh, we all need to get our sleep corrected and all of the things. So thank you for making the difference um, with what you do. And uh, I appreciate your being so much. Thank you. Thank you.